Okay, well, look, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, um, and then I'm going to lead a little bit of a discussion, um, particularly for the Irish partners, but I would also like the, the I suppose, our European partners to, to talk about it. Um, now, we've covered quite a few of these today, and bearing in mind um, that you've all been sitting down for most of the morning, I, I really don't want to go through anything too laborious. I have three or four slides to cover this, but I want to maybe just get a bit of thinking done as we go through it. Um, so just before we start, can I ask the Irish SMEs, in terms of, in terms of your own payments, could I, I just get a question? How many of you have had to go through um, it's a legal proceedings to try and get payments from existing customers and what percentage of your income over the last five years has been subject to that? And I might just ask around. So I'm just wondering, how many people have used legal channels to enforce payment is what I'm trying to get to. What percentage of your income? About 1%. 1%? Yeah, small, yeah, small, similar. Similar? Less than 1%, I'd Less than 1%? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, any, how many people are, have you written off more than that? Yeah, so you've all written off more than that. So basically, if you get to the situation where you need to use your contracts to really try and deliver money, you've probably lost, because most of the cost of recovering that income is going to be lost in legal fees. So, when we talk about that, and the reason I want to ask that question is, when you go into EPC, no different to any other business transaction, the, the legal framework that you're in you know, is really trying to mitigate or eliminate risks before you start so that you don't need to use your legal framework. I think that's, that's a reasonably safe assumption. And if you find a customer and you think, I don't think that customer is going to pay me, and you know deep down, you're not going to enter into an EPC agreement, or probably any, or you're going to ask them for money up front or whatever it is. Um, uh, we, we got to the position in the TEA where we were almost in that space um, with a large client um, where we were trying to facilitate an EPC. And thankfully, one of the bidders came along to me privately and said, look, this particular guy has a history of not paying anyone. Get out and get out quickly. And we did. Um, and one of the things about having a small county like Tipperary is you know a lot of those people. And that's very important. So really, the reason I wanted to just touch that is I'm going to talk about risk strategies. But the number one risk strategy is know your client and be sensible about what, what contracts you enter into, regardless of anything that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about that as that is the number one base of any risk strategy. And all of this that we talk about today is on top of that um, knowledge. OK. Um, <clears throat> So what, when we talk, we've, so we've talked about a good bit about EPC this morning, and I'm not trying to go over it, the same thing again. Um, but really, when we talk about the risk strategy, the risk strategy is based on the scale of project, and the scale of financing, or the type of financing, determines where you start to talk about investing significant money in risk. Um, so for example, if you get into the stage of project finance, where you're talking about very big projects, um, you spend a reasonable amount of money on risk. So, for example, we built a, a community wind farm, and there was probably 100 grand out of the 6 million that was spent on risk management, be it the geotechnical consultant who dug the hole and watched and looked in the ground and said, this is what it is, and if it's not this, it's my PI insurance that will cover it. Um, the risk report on the wind and whether the wind will blow or not, and the PI insurance covering that. So when we had the project built, and it was turning about three or four months, the, the bank who financed it, it's their first wind project in Ireland, they came and met us, and there were six of them, and their job title, every one of the six, had risk in it. And we thought this was hilarious, because the project was built, it was turning, it was delivering energy, it was exceeding expectations, it was blah, 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 blah. The risk is all gone, as far as we were concerned, and they were just financially handing over a couple of months after connection. Um, but I realized at that stage that that is, when you talk about project finance, they're the only ones really taking a risk at that stage. Everyone else is out. Um, 
Uh, so really, when we talk about the scale of some of these large potential ESCOs, particularly the large hospitals and, and LED lighting and whatever it is, they're going to be project finance. And that project finance is going to be bank-led or, or a large financial investor-led. And they're going to want to see how to mitigate risk. So really, we talk about it, whether it's if it's your money or the client's money with a small EPC guarantee, there isn't a third party financer taking risk and therefore there isn't the cost of mitigating that risk or insuring against or getting some other consultant to put his PI insurance on the risk. And that's why I think when we talk about the types of small projects, it can handle project finance overheads because there just isn't, this, isn't the scale of money. So risk, when we talk about project finance type risk, um, does require that kind of larger scale investment. And this sort of stuff and the smaller stuff that we talk about requires a sort of risk mitigation measures and risk strategy that we all use in our businesses all the time. Is this client going to pay? Does this client really want this? You know, and um, meetings, 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 as, as Joe said. Or do we go, are we going to spend a whole lot of time developing a project and they just pull out at the last minute, which is a risk? Okay. Um, so when you're talking about the larger projects and that scale, um, you know, some of the SME, the, the, the traditional methods of finance and projects and risk management um, may not work for some of the larger stuff. However, if we take out a lot of the costs that we talked about today, um, and have a reasonably robust method of, of dispute resolution and so on, um, we can make EPC work. Um, or maybe we can make EPC light work in smaller cases or, or, or so on. Um, you know, but I, I do think we need to think some of that time of developing that, that kind of... Um, that network or the, the approach to working together will take some time and effort to try and do something a little bit different in terms of our risk management. Um, so we talked about a lot this morning about, about um, and this is outside of the brief of my presentation, but I wanted to just talk about something. EPC and, and, and energy services and ener energy performance contracting can be quite difficult. Um, and a lot of you guys are busy now because the, the market in Ireland is, you know, we've seen economic growth. The phone is ringing again where it maybe wasn't a couple of years ago. Um, so why bother? And, and I think the carrot is quite large. We talked about this. The state spends 600 million in energy, um, 200 million in health, about 80 million in water. Um, and the rest across the rest of the state. The legal requirement in Ireland is to try and achieve that by 2020. None of us think we're going to hit it. Um, however, I think we're going to try. And from the discussions I've been having with the department, um, they have a new public sector plan which has been in draft a couple of times. It was reasonably ready to go out right before the government went a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I see that that's going to come soon. Um, the state, the EPA has been calling it, but basically the Irish state is miles behind our, our European objectives in terms of CO2 reduction, our legally binding European targets. And I see the state getting quite involved in the next year to two years. The question is when and how long it takes, but I can see there is going to be a public sector plan. As an example, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform are going through climate training right now. And as part of that climate training, they're being trained as how much this missing of our targets is going to cost us. And therefore, why, instead of saying no to all the initiatives from the Department of Energy, they need to start thinking about how they'll invest. We will have a renewable heat incentive. So I know some of the, some of the people in the room will, will talk about um, energy supply contracts. Um, but I can see we will have a big investment in energy supply contracts probably in 2017, 2018. EPC energy supply and, and energy performance based payments are already in our statutory instrument to cover energy um, services in Ireland. 
And while I don't think the 600 million will realistically be spread in three years, I think it will be spread in over five to 10 years, but there is going to be a large investment from the public sector in energy services. Whether that is, as, as Reinhardt put, the, the, the traditional EPC with the large projects like Joe was trying to do in the swimming pool or his smaller ones or the likes of what we've done in the past, um, whether, whether it's more traditional with an energy performance payment element. Um, either way, there is a big, big opportunity coming and I think we all need to be aware of, of that and get ourselves into the position where we can start to offer those services. Because any one of you on your own may be able to provide some of the services, but to answer the likes of the tender that Joe put out, collectively three or four of you working together in the room would have nailed that tender but because you were all separate, maybe you didn't, and it's the likes of, I don't even know who's been shortlisted, but Ara Marks and, and so on. Are you shortlisted for that? Are you? You could be a subcontractor to them. So they're gonna make the margin that you could have made otherwise. Okay, and that's, that's what I'm trying to get at, because I would rather you guys get the margin and not the, the multinationals. And, you know, if you take what Joe put out there, you've got BMS, CHP and lighting, right? And Paul, did you do some of those audits? Yes. So in the room, we could supply the, the answer to that contract and take 15% out of a multinational profit margin. And that's what, what I want to try and achieve out of this project. How, does, how do you convince the public procurement people not to know that the key is and all the others for your prior experience and, uh, you know, and the massive... <coughs> I would guess if I had the three of you and, and Paul managing it going as a response to that tender with someone who knows how to write a tender, like for example Paul in our office who's, who's very good at winning tenders, I would be very surprised if I couldn't get you over the line. Very surprised. Just the other obstacle would be the finance between the, the, the parties come up with, I think he was saying maybe it was 400,000. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, and that's, that, that's a question for you. Would well, you it's be? a question for all, not just me, it's a question well, for like, everyone. Let's just, let's just say out of that, you're talking two C CHPs and one refurbished CHP. Yeah, yeah. So what are you talking about, 200 grand? Yeah. yeah. Would you be able well, to we, go and yeah, get that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, that's, that's half of the investment. What about lighting? Do you be able to go? We fund You fund all your own lighting. What about the BMS? Would you be able to fund... Yeah. 50 grand, 80 yeah, grand? Yeah, we've done it in the past. We won an SCA about those long time ago. Okay. No, it's very important to have that discussion because, yeah. like, you, you've just potentially lost the opportunity. Now, may some of you may be supplying into them, but you've lost with that margin. Someone else is going to get. And while, you know, while Tipperary is a small county and won't be able to do that many EPC projects of that scale, it's a small country. And to be honest, every one of us has to work nationally. It's, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a, there isn't that scope in, in TIP alone. So I think that there, those opportunities are there. And I think if we can coalesce into a service offering, but also the ability to respond to some of those, those packages. So just to quickly just go through a couple of things, and this, this has come from another European project. Um, when you look at um, some of the potential risks, these slides are very hard to see, but, but basically the likes of things like building owners and disputes and so on, there are ma ways to manage a lot of those. And the trick, the trick with EPC on top of our, our particular SMEs in this network is to identify those risks early in the project, be open about them. So, for example, if there is like technical risks for you guys, there isn't much of a technical risk in lighting. CHPs, I know we have some of your CHPs, as have many others. It's not that technically risky. However, there is some building services issues that need to be managed. Um, there isn't that much technical risk, and all the other risks are about 
you know, how the public building owner works, how they perceive the payment, how they perceive the value, how, they, how do they see the energy savings. And there are a lot of those that we can identify. And I just might, might cover very, very slightly something very interesting that happened over the last two days. I, I don't always do anecdotes, but we did a project of 10 deep retrofits in domestic houses last year. The average was 28,000 euros. So they're almost small EPC projects. Um, each of those homeowners would have been told, this is roughly what you're going to save, and this is how much electricity your heat pump is going to use post-retrofit. And all of those have a meter, and all of those knows. All of those people know what that meter should say. And if it stays below a certain number after the end of your season, that's good value. I had an alternative person who had bought a new house. It was an A3, very low energy house. And they said, my heating bill is twice what you have said those retrofits should be. And over the space of the weekend and this morning, it's come to the fact that his heat pump isn't using any of the power that he thinks it is. And he's just discovered it. But he thought this project was very unsuccessful for me. But when you actually go to it, if someone had just installed a 200 meter, euro meter, it might have um, given him the confidence behind the project. So when we talk about risk identification, risk that the building owner does not accept that they are getting the savings, a small amount of extra investment might decrease all of that. Um, so we need to identify all of those risks and try and mitigate them through diff different things. So you've got your risks from your own side, which would be non-payment or, or change of a building use or so on. So if a building does change, you need to have it identified and you need to be upfront with the building owner, be it um, a public building owner and say, look, if you decide to stop using the building, you need to buy out, buy us out, and it's gonna cost you money and be clear and upfront in advance. Um, when you look at the financiers, the financiers, um, like their big, big challenge is going to be what happens if someone goes, goes into bankruptcy um, or if something happens with the, the technical risks. So they, from a technical risk, they might look for a third party engineer to certify your work, certify your proposed savings. And that's a cost. And that cost is cost to mitigate their risk. Um, And then from the building owner's point of view, um, you go and bust is a, is a big risk for a building owner. Um, so we have a maintenance contract for a small wind turbine on the motorway. The, the other part, the counterpart of that maintenance contract has gone bust and we don't have access to, to fix whatever has gone wrong with that particular wind turbine. And as a result, the project has failed. Um, So that type of thing, um, people going in, I suppose the, the failure of, of delivering from a public building owner that it's not saving or the, the services aren't being maintained, all of those things really need to be established open and upfront. So whether it's a, a biomass boiler failing, that the, the building owner has the right to step in and take over either the biomass or the backup heating system that they can, can manage the project so that they don't have a service risk. And again, from the TEA's point of view, we've gone through a lot of these. We've made some mistakes. And anyone who says they haven't is lying. And you learn more from your mistakes about any, than anything that goes well. Um, but we didn't have a clause to say we could refuel an oil boiler for a backup heating system in a biomass boiler in the first project we did. And as a result, when the boiler went down and there was some dispute between the, the boiler, the hour ESCO provider and their, their fuel supplier, there was an issue. And we didn't have the right to step in. Um, now, we did step in because we had to, but there was a risk in that step in. And we now know that we should have those step in rights. So all of those things need to be done in a standard template, a standard contract. And for you guys to get involved together, you need to spend the time to understand those standard things, know that you're protected from those standard things, and know that you're open to being to someone stepping in above you if you don't perform. I don't think they're all, I don't think they're the, the hard parts. 
That's just a risk res res register from SAAI's guidance document where you identify all the risks. And again, making sure that this risk register is clear and open to both client, the different partners in, in an SME network, um, and any financier if, if it is there. Um, I won't go through that slide because it's, it's, it's a little busy. Um, but just to conclude, right, there is going to be a big, a big investment coming. You can be there or you cannot be there. It's up to you guys to decide what you want to do. Um, you need to be able to operate at scale and cover different services, as you've all seen with the Dublin, Dublin solution there. Um, we want to try and help in terms of the EPC Plus project where we will try and streamline the ability of you guys to work together and try and act as a, I suppose, an independent third party. Um, and really, you know, as, as you've all said, the courts don't really work for this scale of project and for small projects, and you're better off to try and design out and mitigate out risks. Um, and I'd love to say I have all the solutions there, but from asking ye, ye have the solution. So I don't need to figure out how to finance projects. If you guys can all finance your own projects already, because you've already had to figure that out from wherever you get the finance, be it Irish, state, banks, uh, equity investors, or, or, or European funders. Um, and really, what I'd like to be able to do over the next 20 minutes, really, is, is to ascertain your interest in seeing how you want to make, bring this forward. Um, Joe has obviously put up two projects. They're reasonably small. Um, while one might be one-sided one just on lighting, the other one is certainly could, could be useful for, invest, for a larger um, group. But there are two projects that we know are going to happen. They're probably going to go out to procurement in the next three to four weeks, bearing in mind the timelines. And I'd like us to see if we can try and at least try and tackle some of those. Um, I know the TEA has a couple of projects that, that may go out in the near future um, that we'd like to see, see people go back to. Um, so really, if I can start with maybe just one question to each of our SMEs, or two questions. One is, what are the key things you want to be doing um, as part of providing um, support to an SME network, or what are the, what's, the, what's the technology that you get involved? Are you interested, and would you like to put probably two to three days' work over the next six months to, to put a consortium together? And that's really, and what are your key kind of wants out of that? Um, I might start, sorry, you're on this side, yeah. you get caught. Uh, like I said, we're a lighting company, we fund everything ourselves as it is. Um, if the opportunity was there, we'd probably fund other technologies if the, you know, if the revenues were there. Um, our business model is very much around uh, recurring revenues, and if it's, if it's guaranteed stuff, then we'd no problem financing it. Uh, from our point of view, it would be a project leader would be the, the main want that we would have that, to pull together you know, four or five, three or four different companies that would be the the need or the requirement that that you have. Yeah, that I and see. Would you be interested in working as a a non project leader as well? Oh sorry, yeah, sorry, I mean I meant we would work as a non project leader. Okay. I think there's a, a requirement there for we would prefer if there was somebody there to pull it together. Um, okay. you know that we'd be more than happy to work with yeah. Very good. Um I go yeah, it's um yeah, we do combine even power units, CHP units, uh, supply CHP units. Yeah, we'd we'd obviously be we be interested, I suppose it's our second day coming along, so we'd be we'd be interested in uh, spending a bit more time on it and uh, trying to drive it forward. Um, I suppose what do we want out of it? Obviously we want more business out of it. Um, but also just a network of, of contacts for other I suppose high efficiency technologies as well because I suppose when we do go into sites we're always asked do we do lighting, do we do BMS, do we do, you know, so there are opportunities there. Um, but I suppose 
one of the questions I'd have is it up to the suppliers, the individual suppliers, to go out and try and generate business, or is it going to be someone like TEA that will bring the projects to the group or the group to, to, to go out and source them? That, that's a good question, and that's one I think we need to tease out. Like, the TA would be happy to try and do that, but you have to finance that. Because yeah. I, I don't have free engineering time. I don't have free sales time. I don't, you know, so, and neither, neither does anyone else. So that would require a commitment and an agreement and a plan. Um, and I wouldn't start there, because you have just told me that you already have clients that are already asking you about other services. Yeah. yeah. And I reckon, I could be wrong, but if, if, if I just look around the room, and we put all those people together, including the TA or, or, or maybe Paul as well. There's a lot of that out there. Yeah. There's a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of. But it's just there'd be a big element of trust as well. Like if we were to bring a project, like obviously, you know, there's BMS supplier that would have worked with maybe other CHB suppliers, or there's lighting supplier or whoever it is that would have worked with other CHB suppliers. So there'd be a big element of trust there to bring the project to the, the table at this stage. Yeah. And you know, we, we thought about this long and hard in, in trying to invite people in. Um, I'm not going to force anyone to marry. I'm not an ar arranged marriage uh, matchmaker, I think the word is. That's up to you guys to work and carve out a route. And if two of you separately come to me and say, we'd like to work together on something like this, just two of you, any, any more than one, um, we'd help that individually. While We'd like to say everyone is going to be involved. There are many different issues. Some people might finance, some people might feel they want to work with someone else. There, you know, there might be history that I don't have any involvement in. Um, so we could have two separate SME groups out of this. Yeah. Um, and just on the finance, I suppose, like a lot of projects won't have a requirement for CHP because it's a little bit more niche than some of the other products. Um, like, would there be an opportunity there for? Was to put some finance in and to get something out of a project, or you've just said the same thing as well. Yeah, like I, I don't, I don't. I'm not going to answer yes to that, but certainly I don't think there would be any barrier to suggesting that particular opportunity. Um, like what we're trying to do, if if we step a little bit back from it, is from the TEA's point of view, we're trying to unlock energy savings. That's the primary goal of what we're at this far and to generate business for temporary businesses, right? So they're the kind of two primary aims. If you have a group of SMEs who can't finance, and someone comes in and says, well, I can finance, what are they going to turn around and ask you? How much is your finance? Can I get it cheaper somewhere else? So if your finance is competitive, they're going to be happy. If your finance isn't competitive, they're not going to be happy. You know, so it's, we can lead you to that question but I can't make a deal, and the deal is going to be based on how, how good the offering is. Um, and if there's two involved with, with packages of finance, and maybe someone else has as well, um, it is going to be a, a negotiation point of view, you know? Um, but it's, it is very interesting to see that when I, stand, when I listen to a lot of debates about energy efficiency, people, people start with, it. it's the unlocking of finance. We have a very small number of businesses in the room here, and two of you are off in finance. And I bet if you went to AIB and Ray, Ray O'Neill, he's there shouting about, I've got all this money to lend. I've got all this money to lend. It's about the project, to get the project right. I, I would say once a week, I get a request to finance projects from people who have money to try and finance projects. I'm sure you all get them. Challenges to get the project right and the client right. I actually don't think finance is in any way a problem. I could be wrong, but I don't think it is. It's getting competitive finance that matches with the return on a project that's the challenge. Move on yeah, um, to yourself. Harry Tom from Screen Guard Green Energy Solutions. We, um, I'm sales manager there. We provide um, monitoring, targeting, and control uh, across all ranges of businesses, from corporate, public sector, anyway, SME, small businesses. Um, again, with the EPC, I mean, with this, I mean, this is our second meeting, and, and we're sitting and talking again. And, and, and um, I mean, my, my question, I mean, for the European partners here as well, does I mean, does EPC carry any weight whatsoever? I mean, when you're going in, looking at contracts, holding contracts against other competitors, 
um, that would be a question in, in relation to our own circumstance around here. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, getting in, I mean, like everybody in the room, I mean, for our Irish competitive people in the, in the room, is the business there? Um, I know uh, Tipperary Energy are, 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 are trying to push a couple of things forward as well, but I mean, yes, I mean, if the business is there, I'm, you know, three to four days on, on a big contract wouldn't be an issue, anyway, certainly for us. Um, a lot of people talk about finance, there's finance to be picked up off the ground over there uh, outside in Ireland for anything. I mean, you just mentioned Paul AIB. They're handing it out if the, if the project is right and they know that the money and the, their risk is okay, but they're getting back their money as well. They're getting back an interest. And I know I was just at the energy show there, I had a stand in, in the RDS there a couple of days ago and uh, had a great talk with energy and, and they're providing finance now. So, I mean, for finance there is no issue. There is no issue whatsoever for contracts. So, and, and, and just, I mean, to conclude, I won't talk just for, for a, a scale, yes, I mean, if, if everybody is prepared to get in and sit down in certain contracts that's there, if, if the business is there, but my, my whole thing is, is this EPC, um, does it carry weight when you are competing against the Aramarks and other people, I mean, so, you know, that's, that's in Ireland, but in, in, in the European context, does it, or has it? you know, compared to, you know, European Aramark type people, you know, that the EPC are, 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 are competing. So can, I just, can I just try and draw out your question? Are you asking the question is, do clients actually want to invest in EPC, sorry, do clients actually want to facilitate EPC projects on their sites, or are you asking, does an SME have any chance of competing with one of the... Well, both, I suppose. Okay. I mean, both. Just categorise in both areas. Yeah, I might throw that question to you. Um, rather than going back to Aristoteles again, do you see EPC as a competitive advantage that clients really want to see from an investment to, to try? Oh, and I think that's the that's indeed a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and what what you see in general that in the US it's 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 it's, it's quite a success in the public sector at least, and we see also good examples of well, success, success, success stories um, in the private sector in the US and Canada as well. While in Europe it's still still quite difficult and it's maybe, so the, the big question whether, whether, it will be, whether it will be taken up in the market or not. Um, but you can say there is still a lot of interest from public authorities uh, from Europe because the, the concept is very logic. Nothing, nothing wrong with the theoretical concept. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the big question is whether it will be taken up by the market. Yes. So you will have to test it, I think. Or we all have, will have to test it. Right. And the second question about whether SMEs are taken seriously versus, I might throw that one to you. Do you think SMEs will be taken Seriously, on a European basis? I think you'd have to look at it on a country by country uh, basis. Um, it, it really, in my country, in Greece, um, I'm sure that clients would prefer local SMEs to big multinationals. Uh, they feel more comfortable with people they know, with people they, whose history they know, and uh, who will be with them for the next 20, 30 years. And uh, they, they generally distrust big multinationals who uh, might only be there for a few years and will then leave after uh, receiving the profits that they want. So um, definitely in my country, I, I don't, you'd have to ask the others. Uh, in my country, uh, clients uh, would definitely choose a local network of SMEs uh, we should bring someone out over here. <laughs> <laughs> I can say from being a procurer of energy projects, and we've probably spent seven or eight million outside of the wind farm over the last 10 years, or certainly six years. Um, public authorities in Ireland want to see Irish companies. Absolutely want to see the, the term green jersey. I, I am sick to the teeth of hearing the green jersey. 
We all want to do it. But what I will say is there's a big difference between a professional Irish company and other Irish companies. And when a public procurer has to follow European procurement rules and says, if you haven't got declaration 45, and then you don't see it responded, you have to throw out the tender. And people respond to that and think, oh, that person is trying to exclude that SME. Um, and I'm not, I haven't even ever tendered to us for anything, so I can feel reasonably good about that. But um, what I would find is, you do find a lot of public bodies having to exclude tenders. So I did a tender recently, and in the evaluation, I found that some of the SMEs didn't bother filling in minimum required documents. Now, there is legislation that, that binds public procurement. And if you don't have that, I dot it, T crossed. If I'm to let you through the procurement process, I'm basically taking all the risk and putting my neck on the line of, of allowing someone through the process. And that's important as a first thing. And the second thing is, what I see really, really good is if you, have a, if you have a good consortium. So for example, if Joe's project had someone who was recognized as being very good with CHP, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about Temtech just as an example, because you're probably the market leaders in Ireland by share, I don't know, are up there. If someone comes in with Temtech on the list and they're the market leader or within the top two or three of any particular technology, maybe an SME or otherwise, nobody's going to say that they don't tick that box. That's the box ticked. That's all Joe is sitting there with his PQQ is saying, have you experienced? Tick. Do they do a finance offering? Tick. Box ticked. Um, but certainly, you know, as a consortium, if you don't, if you, if you come along with questions, do, do, just trying to go back to the question, will public bodies take SMEs seriously? Yes, but SMEs have to respond seriously. And that takes an investment of significant time in looking at all the boxes that need to be ticked and ticking all the boxes. That's why the delegates are here. That's why we're here to, to, yeah. to make that decision. And you know, if the decision isn't there between the majority of them, forget about it. You know, there's no yeah. point. And that takes time and effort. Oh, and yeah, therefore, okay, yeah. someone has to fund it. Like, that was part of my point. I think either yourself or Donald mentioned that there's somebody in your office that is very good at writing tenders. And I suppose that's where I'd see someone like TEA being able to help a group of, of SMEs come together as a uh, yeah. collaborative. And, and maybe it's TA or maybe it's ovaries, because they're the, that's the reason why, one of the reasons, many reasons why Paul is in the room, but, but you know, our, in some of those projects, we might be on the other side. So I might be working with Joe to advise him on, on how to set his procurement documents together, and I did participate a couple of times, as did Paul on that, and therefore, it can't be on both sides of the tender. But what I'm saying is, is Realistically, if there's a set of procurement documents to go out from a public authority in Ireland, they're answerable and winnable by, by an SME, but the SME have to tick the boxes. And basically that means if you don't meet the tender turnover, you bring someone else in who does and gets you over the line because it's the combined turnover. And we've had to do that on, on a couple of different occasions at a couple of different levels. Um, but you have, to, you have to see that and, and see that opportunity and go after it. You know? But it does take time and effort. Can I move on to questions? So, are you interested? What's your key services that you provide, particularly in the energy space? Um, and what's your, what do you see as, as the biggest issue to try and overcome? Uh, well, yes, yes, obviously we are interested. Um, we're with uh, I'm a champion pump, so obviously we're in the, the water pumps, heating, chilling, and the sewage. So we're quite involved in this industry. And our products are a high energy user in most buildings. Um, so we see it as a big market. One of the problems we have, that's why we're here, is, is that we're not big enough to go for some of the larger jobs. We see that uh, for some of the large public jobs or even for multinationals. We're seen as too small, and even though we're 46 people in a company, we're still a small, a small company. Um, I think it's a good idea for groups to come together. Uh, I think we all need to get to know each other a lot better. Uh, that will hopefully happen over time. There is a big, big trust issue, and one of the things is, say, for a large contract, is 
how, how the risk is shared out and what happens if one of the partner's products is not performing, are we all taking a hit? And that's the one big trust issue which we all have to overcome. Obviously, yes, if I <coughs> if I'm involved in the pumps, yes, I'll stand over my equipment in answer to the question. Yes, we also fund and have funded our own equipment as well, so we're not afraid to do that on various projects as well. But then there's a lot of stuff outside of our control. We know we know nothing about lighting, we know nothing about CHV. And if something else fails, how are we all as a group liable to the project? And that's one of the things, the big things for us that we would need to kind of trash out uh, with that. Could, can, I, can I might just ask one of the Europeans, how, how does that cross risk sharing work? Where, where there technically isn't an overlap between your pump and your light, they're doing two different energy services. How is that managed? Well, it, it is indeed very important to, to, to take that into account and I don't have a, well, the answer to it, but um, it's, um, well, first of all, it's knowing, knowing your partner and it's, 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 I think certainly in the environment of SMEs, um, it's, it's more about trust than contracts because contracts take time, SMEs are not willing to, to spend a lot of time to work out very difficult contracts when you handle this. That's, that's for large men, large companies, not for SMEs. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't have the... the that would suggest that one way we need to mitigate it is to get to know one another in terms of we look, we talk to each other, we see what projects each other has delivered, and, and you take a measure on that, really. That's all you can do. Yeah. To go step by step, actually, uh, project by project. And uh, there's something as well the, uh, opportunity in the short term and long term opportunities. So, what is important is to see the long term opportunities. And if you take that into account, then you will behave, behave better. Because if, 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 you, if you don't perform uh, as expected, then who will be kicked out of the group. Yes. So, so, so you have to combine short-term and, and medium and long-term uh, opportunities. One, one of the difficulties around it, I mean, we do, we do qualify pretty much all the time for public procurement contracts. But where we do get caught out is, is in terms of our cost. We find it difficult at times to be able to compete with the big guys for some reason or other they seem to be able to drop the price even to about half of the price that we would go in at times, which hardly seems sustainable. And I certainly have enough evidence of it out there to believe that they're winning contracts and not delivering on the service uh, and just moving on to find the next victim three years later. Yeah. I have enough experience on that. I actually have seen that happen. And I do think that people in the public service who are operate for the public service, don't have the ability, the capability, the training, the experience to actually evaluate these tenders properly. That's my personal experience. They could do with some of the expertise maybe that exists around this room, but for sure out there I have enough evidence that the public servants don't actually know how to evaluate proper contracts, end up in dispute, take the view that they're about three years that they exist for, Client says, oh, they're only getting to know the site, they're betting themselves in, they're getting to see the processes, that they'll be better next year. Next year arrives, um, maybe they sack the manager off the site, because I've seen that happen as well, and they start again on the second year, and they get halfway through the second year, and they say, it's not getting much better around here, guys, is it? Okay, we'll get rid of that guy, uh, or that company, will we? Oh, hold on a minute, contract, what's the contract about? Oh, legal, is it worth is it worth the hassle at this stage? We just wait for another year and we get rid of them then. And I see that happen on at least two occasions. To our detriment I have to say, so there's a personal bit sorry if you yeah, I think that's, that a, that's an excellent point actually. And I suppose that's why I, I was saying there that the whole process needs facilitation and then it asks who, who who's gonna pay for it because it all costs money. And I, I've seen as well, I've served on the other side, and you're right, where these big groups are put together in the public sector, and I serve with them. You have the finance agency representing the country, but you, you know, 
she was a lady at the time, she was only interested in, in euros and she, first thing was, what's this gigajoules, what the hell is that, Does, you know, she hadn't a clue, and she was asking honestly, but it, you're right, it is, it is getting a little better, I have to say, in terms of the weighting, because the weighting when it used to be 60-40 in terms of uh, price being 60% 60, 60 of marks and uh, uh, the quality and the ability to deliver and all the rest of it, 40% 40, 40 of the marks, it's nearly impossible to weigh those ones to get the price anyway wrong. Uh, but I have seen them shift now a little bit in terms of the last couple of price uh, projects that were out there were 50 50. But I think it would be much better with 60 40 in terms of the ability to deliver and the technical and, and I think that. I think it would be much better if, if we actually went to the two stage process yeah. and you screen out people. Now, I, we've been involved procuring biomass projects but also supporting others who are procuring. And one very large multinational who, if I mentioned you'd all go, oh, yeah, of course, but you probably, you'd probably know them, but I'm not going to mention them. They, they had done that in a couple of projects, failed to deliver, or they were, they were a building project, and their job was going below the price and squeeze out extras the whole way through the project, and they had a person who was employed to, to basically squeeze extras out. Um, and they competed for a public contract and as part of the PQQ, they had to say, these are the five projects that we've done to get ourselves over the line. Now, that particular individual in the public sector who, who asked us, said, can you go and evaluate, did they actually achieve a good service in that project? He went over and above, as most people do, and we went and we interviewed each of the service providers and brought them to two of their projects where we were particularly concerned. You know the company, if you know the company and you have it in your head. So we went and said, right, you said you've done all these things in this particular facility. We went to that particular facility. There was a colleague of mine who was an expert in biomass, went to that facility and started asking all the people and looked for the performance and found out that the performance of that particular facility was very poor and was able to then say the performance of this facility is poor um, or is not meeting what you said it did, it's not matching what your document is, and therefore we're not accepting that as evidence. Um, so there is the ability within the public procurement process to screen out people that the public sector maybe doesn't do, or maybe doesn't go to the level of detail that they should do. And any time I'm involved, or, or the likes of Paul is involved, or anyone who's been around enough, we do say try and use the mechanisms that are there and that are robust and available and try and use them to get rid of people at PQQ stage who haven't delivered and who have poorly performed in previous contracts. Um, and as I, as I realize we are on camera, I'm certainly not going to say any, any organization names, but you know, in particular, the tools are there, but the public sector doesn't use them. And I think that's the challenge. And I did advocate at a particular part of SEAI's um, development of the EPC handbook to, to develop a register. Now, I don't know whether that's been taken up or not, but when people perform really well on a project that they could get a, a green tick, you know, as such, and then that helps them get further work, because I think that's what we need. Because it's very hard, if you ring up a public sector person and say, did Company A, did the Tipperary Energy Agency provide a good service and would you recommend them for the future? And can you put that in writing? When you ask the third question, you're just not going to get an answer because they could be sued. And unless they've documented poor performance and managed poor performance, it's very hard for them to do it. Unless you can go on site and see it, the poor performance, or see that they actually haven't done what they said they did. No, you're, you're dead right. They, they, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to put together a document set. Yeah. But if you don't go beyond the document set, um, you're, you're not necessarily going to get the result that you set out to get at the beginning. And it's about the capacity of the individual that's on the other end of the document set Absolutely. to pick up the phone, to read between the lines, and then figure out how to use the legislation and the framework around public procurement at PQQ stage to screen people out. And if you do it at PQQ stage where you haven't evaluated a price, you can never be accused of doing anything messing with the price or, or you know, engage at that level of, of, of poor management of projects. And I think that's really, really important. When we go forward in the next kind of year to two years where there's going to be a good few EPC projects 
coming out of the public sector, I would guess. Um, you know, Donald's coming at this from health. There's been three attempts to do EPC in the health service that have failed. And, you know, as Donald put it at the beginning, he saw it was very obviously going to fail at the very beginning, and that's because of the competence made, well, not necessarily the competence, but the, the, the attempt to get all the way to the very far end of EPC without even having to learn to walk. And I think, you know, we need to start small, and this group needs to start small and do small projects and get small projects done well, everyone comfortable, get to know each other, and then build it in, in time, because it is, is long-term. And I think your presentation from Austria was very good, because you said, you know, we're starting at 10, 20,000 projects, small stuff. You know, get, every, get everyone's feet together, and then you can start going for the big stuff. Um, do you want to add anything else in terms of just what your, what your business services are? Yeah, I suppose um, we're, we're 30 years old, I was home. Um, that's one of the senior partners, so you're probably talking more uh, inclusively than me. But um, basically, we have two main streams to the business. We provide building management systems, um, Siemens and Cylon and others. And we're primarily in the pharmaceutical medical device sector there. So uh, we be providing greenfield pharmaceutical projects with qualified BMS. It's quite a high level. Um, they have to qualify the areas that they're making the drug in. Um, so it tends to be server based and quite high end. Um, and we have a number of large contracts at the moment for General and like Bristol Myers, Good in Dublin, and uh, Alexia in Dublin. We have a plethora of those across the country. Um, we're also a HVAC uh, maintenance and project provider. So we do things like, um, as we spoke to Donald about, uh, full end to end. Um, uh, change of ventilation systems for operating theatres and water for the hospital, several other hospitals where we provide a new AHU, bring it up to the, the relevant standards, and part of that would be uh, energy heat recovery, uh, which would be new to these guys a lot of the time it's single pass and they just throw all their treated air out of the building. Um, and what Frank is alluding to really is over the last couple of years we've seen a huge number of, of our contracts uh, become globalised by people like Johnson Controls or nationalised by other uh, FM providers. They're not providing the same level of skilled engineer that we would be. Uh, they're providing maybe a more general mechanical fitter who doesn't really understand thermal dynamics or HVAC principles. So when you might fit <coughs> it may end up consuming 30% more energy when he's done his repair, that type of thing. Um, and we've seen a huge number of those public procurement contracts where we had um, a hospital or a a school or something go to to uh, to much lower skilled organisations for much lower prices for kind of poor qualitative measurement happening post tender. You know, um, I suppose the biggest concern for us is, as we say, we're 30 years old. There's a few problems in the bank as well. Um, so financing some of the smaller projects for our own customers is, has, has been has been something we've done. And we won an SEA award for um, for optimising Brom Thomas's. Uh, building in Cork there some years ago, which we financed. Um, but the challenge for us, some of it to be honest, is we don't really want to choose all our customers to a new group, or unless we're very confident that we're not going to find them becoming competitors in six or 12 months or two years' time. Um, there's an awful lot of knowledge and service around these specifics um, that we don't necessarily want to give away to anyone for free. Um, so really what we want to do is, is, is get new customers, and, and retain some of the existing ones, um, and, and to be in a non-competitive environment where, you know, as we described, we're all adding some individual specific skill to each other, um, and that there's some kind of a future non-compete around maybe introducing. And one of the things we do outside of this um, is we do work with other non-competing firms and try to leverage customers for each other. Um, so we're very interested in, in doing those kinds of things, provided no risk to, to our existing business. Very good. And I, and I do think that that, what, what we might call a simple spin that we may have, that's, I think, where we're, where we're going to start, where you've got your lighting that you ignore instead of, you know, giving Alan a turn and Alan gives you something back in return for that, you know? And I think, you know, I think that's very important. Um, and maybe just the last statement that I'd like, I'd like to maybe share is, over the last couple of months, you know, with some of our some of our existing clients and with with some of the other energy agencies around Ireland, um, something has come very clear to, to me 
if there is a need from your clients for a particular service, you have to meet that service. If you can't meet that service, the client is going to get someone else in. And if you're not in a position of bringing someone in to meet that service, make your client nice and happy and happy about it and walk away thinking the TA has done a wonderful job. It doesn't necessarily have to be a TA person. There's something in it for you so that you're not losing it and it's not costing you. Um, but I think that's something that we all need to be very wary of. And the reason I reference the other energy agencies is there's a lot of people in Ireland who work in what they call energy agencies, they're local authority officers. Energy officers, and they talk about um, providing for the needs of their county, be it other counties outside of Tipperary. Um, and they see us and see us as a threat. And I, I always refer to it and I say, well, if you don't provide a service for the people in your county, somebody else will. Whether it's us or whether it's Campion Pumps providing that service or someone else, someone else is going to provide it. If you're not there, and that's why I think something that could work very well in this group is where you know, you've got an existing client and you see here's the nine opportunities they have, start and get a couple of them met. They're happier with you, you're more likely to be their preferred person to go to. Um, and you know, and it, is the, it is the case of most SMEs and public bodies, they want to focus on the core work. They'd actually like someone just to come, come along that they trust. So they've worked with you for the last 20 years, they know you do a good job, and you say, look, I can do all your lighting, it's going to pay back over six years. You get your margin out of it, you get your work out of it, and, and hey presto. I know it sounds nice and simple, but that concept isn't alien to you all. You all do it all the time. Um, and what we want to do is, is get that into a more EPC type method where we're really delivering the energy savings, proving we're delivering the energy savings and, and bringing, bringing that, that element out of it. Um, Okay, so yeah. maybe just to, if we can conclude from, from the discussion um, at our next meeting, which you've all said you're interested in coming to, um, I might propose that each, each of the SMEs would present their service offerings, reasonable amount of detail, where people can actually get into the core of what you are good at and really good at. Um, Present some of the opportunities that you see that you don't take advantage of, that other people may be interested in taking advantage of. I'm going to ask you to bring along a project or a client. You don't have to say who the client is or what the project is. Specific, well, you do need to say what the project is, but not the client. That you feel you could get them over the line if someone has provided an offering. So, for example, you mentioned lighting. You have X number of clients, pick one where you know they've crap lighting or crap services insulation in their, in their plant room or crap pumps or whatever it is. Bring along that client in your head, say this is what I think that client needs, who wants to offer it? And out of that, you could have a deal. And the other thing I'd like you all to do, I suppose, is with well, two other things. One is what you think an acceptable margin is on bringing projects. If you were the sales person, what is that sales cost? Because if you're bringing along someone and you have to go and sit down with that client, that costs time and money and there needs to be a reward. And you all need to come across and, and agree a figure. Um, and the last one in terms of financing, I'd like you all to bring along your finance offerings um, in terms of trying to share what it is, roughly how much it costs, you may, ideally how much it costs, what are the sort of gates that you have to go through for that finance offering. I don't necessarily have to say where it's coming from, but so that the other people in the room can see, well, that actually is more competitive than what I'm doing. Let's think about how we might use that. Is there anything else you want out of that meeting? We want maybe a team. We want a team for a project. Team for a project. We're probably all in for a project. Okay. At least one until we learn. What is the experience? Well, that, okay. That. Yeah. Anything else? Free dinners. Free dinners. <laughs> Free dinners. <laughs> Free dinners. <laughs> Free dinners. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, there, there, is a, there is a school of thought that no Irish business will actually happen until there's a few pints had. So we might, <laughs> we might try and organize that too. Um, is, is there anything else specifically that you would like the TEA to bring along to that? Like, if we can, we're going to bring along a project to it, ideally. Um, is there anything else from a standard agreements point of view that, that you'd like to see? Or, like, we can go through and present a whole pile of standard clauses, but everyone just falls asleep. Like, that, you can't do that. You need to sit down and look at a contract yourself and say, there are the four or five things I have concerns with. Um, and I don't think between now and the next time is the right time to do that. I think we'll do that between that time and the next one. But I'm not, I don't propose we will stand up and present contract clauses until everyone falls asleep. Because you need to sit down and get time. In terms of some of the European partners, what else do you think we should be considering as part of the next session? I think you need a big uh, marketing campaign to attract clients. Attract okay. clients. So. I don't know whether that's ready yet. I think. Yeah, but I think it's something on the list, but I don't know. I think internally we have probably have enough yes. projects to start. Uh, well, to come back on your question and, and remarks uh, about uh, Tristan, whether to, to be sure that the other part performs as he has stated. I think, well, a lot of thinking about this and also within the ABC Chris project, uh, we are developing or trying to develop in good practices and kind of stuff. We can also learn from large companies that had the time to. To, to, to when they work together in a joint venture or whatever, how they, how they try to solve it. Um, so uh, there is actually quite a lot of material available, but you you have to make it more simpler, you, so easy to understand for some key performance indicators you could develop. But uh, that's quite difficult to, to define a good KPI um, and, and, to, and to monitor the KPI. So, it's a good, it's a good tool, but make it as simple as possible for your specific environment. Um, so I and are you that discussion to to, to 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 talk about this and what would work in your specific environment uh, at okay. a low cost is is I think very helpful. Okay. Is there anything else that that the Europe different because everyone else is at the same situation across Europe that that you're all trying to get SMEs to work together or to support them establishing. Is there anything else you've had at that sort of kind of second or third session where people are really getting closer together and there's projects starting to come on the table? Is there anything else, any other tools you've used or anything else you think we haven't covered already? Use the EPC Plus project. Obviously, you're not going to form partnerships just because the EPC Plus project is here. Uh, you should be looking more long term. But it is there until March 2018, and your activities will be disseminated via this project. And so, it, it is a sort of marketing um, tool, the EPC Plus project. It's there now until March 2018. I'm not saying you should form a partnership just because the EPC Plus project is there, but use it while it is there. Okay. It can give uh, cred credibility to, uh, to a product if you are using uh, these this tools developed by the product, I think. Okay. Uh, I would like just to add, um, before your next meeting probably, it would be worth if you are going for company internal communication so that you decide together with your uh, colleagues or bosses or whatever that what is your company strategy, how does it fit your company strategy, does it meet your long term objectives, does it, is there a conflict of interest, and probably it's, it's worth to talk about it because we, we figured out with some SPIN members that they said oh, okay we need to, to discuss it more in detail back home again and so probably it would be worth to talk about your own company strategy if it fits to it. Very good. Okay, I think we call the savings to a halt. We're kind of going a bit behind. Uh, lunch is served at the distro just down the hall. 
Um, I know the group partners are, you know, meeting here later, and I, I guess the tables may be reorganised. Um, there's an evaluation sheet that passed around. You might leave it behind and uncollect it. Um, I wish, wish to thank the SMEs for coming because you know you give up time today, and that's you know, considerable. Um, 